It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lesseur from the CBS television news staff and Richard Whitkin of the United Press. Our distinguished guest for this evening is His Excellency Dr. Ting Fu F. Chiang, permanent representative from China to the United Nations. Around the head of our guest tonight gathers one of the world's diplomatic storm clouds. The question of course is should his seat at the United Nations be taken by the representative of Communist China? Dr. Chiang, now that a an agreement has been signed in Indochina. How secure do you think your seat is at the United Nations? The immediate effect of the agreement in regard to Indochina on China's seat is very slight. The long range effect remains to be seen. When the General Assembly <coughs> meets this fall, I anticipate a very hard struggle. I have no doubt that I will win. Well, Dr. Tsiang, why do you think that the uh, Chinese Communists are so anxious to get into the United Nations? There is one reason, and uh, one reason only, for <coughs> the prestige that that seat would confer on them. I see. Well, do you think there would be any use in uh, bringing Communist China into the United Nations to show them up the way the Russians have been showed up by the use of so many vetoes and forcing them to take a stand on issues? I think uh, uh, there are so many other ways of showing them up. So many other ways of forcing them to take a stand on this and that question. I just mentioned this factor of prestige. I like to add prestige not only uh, with the Chinese people, but prestige throughout the Far East. Dr. Chiang, if the question of uh, Communist China taking a seat at the United Nations should be pressed by some of the countries which have recognized Communist China, would you automatically veto it on the Security Council or would you wait for the United States to do it? Not at all. I would uh, immediately veto it. That is in the Security Council. I see. But how about the chances of defeating the move on other organs of the United Nations like the General Assembly where there is no veto? Well, we have had that battle more than 100 times already. And every time we have won, I think we will continue to win. Well, let me get this straight. In other words, you don't think the United States would ever have to use its veto on the Security Council because you automatically would veto any move by Communist China to gain a seat there? The veto is an indication of the policy of a government. It's up for the United States to decide, to decide whether she will veto or not. But that doesn't mean that uh, uh, my veto would make it unnecessary for U.S. citizens to, to cast a veto. Well, do you mean, sir, that uh, there's a legal problem that nationalist China might be considered procedurally to be an interested party and therefore might not be allowed to vote on such an issue? No, that cannot be done. There's no legal point to that. But I say the veto on the part of any government, any delegate, is an indication of that uh, delegation's policy. But and... Uh, we do not uh, say uh, vote differently because all those will vote in some particular way. Well, Dr. Chiang, mm -hmm. uh, what makes you think that this question will be vetoable? Suppose it's regarded as a procedural question, as the Security Council has agreed, as some of the great powers have agreed in the past. It's not subject to the veto. You remember when the question came up in the Security Council, it began in 1950. I drew the distinction between credentials and right of representation. Credentials may be considered a procedure question. If anybody question my credentials, that's procedure. And all you can do, you have to do is wire to Minister of Foreign Affairs of China say now, does TF still represent you? What is at stake is the right of a government to representation. Well, that's a vetoable question because that's a, a question of the highest political importance. Well, uh, Dr. Chiang, you say that you have defeated the uh, question of Communist China's representation on the Assembly and other bodies of the UN more than a hundred times. Yes. But 
suppose you fail to defeat it once. Now, would it be legally possible for there to be two Chinas at the United Nations? Nationalist China on the Security Council and Communist China in the General Assembly or some other body of the UN? I don't think that is possible. And I don't think that is desirable either. I think it's best for the United Nations to face this issue. It must make a decision one way or the other. That sort of compromise I don't think would get us anywhere. Well, well what do you think would happen, Dr. Tsiang, if by some chance Communist China were voted into the General Assembly, say, where there is no veto? What would happen to the United Nations? What would its future be? Well, I'm sure that uh, many people in the world would lose faith in the United Nations. That will be a big blow to the prestige of the United Nations. Well, Dr. Tsiang, there have been people, some congressmen in, in the United States, who have said that they think the United States should withdraw from the United Nations if Communist China were permitted to enter. Now, do you think that Nationalist China should withdraw if Communist China <laughs> got a seat on any of the bodies at the UN? Well, I wouldn't, uh, I couldn't answer that question offhand. It depends what sort of body it is. Suppose they've got a seat in some inconsequential body, I don't think we would withdraw. <laughs> I see. Well, is it possible that there is a solution to the problems of the two Chinas between the problem of the Formosa government and the mainland government. Could there possibly be an agreement on, we'll say, a trusteeship for Formosa? That's the entire other question. You know, to uh, suggest a trusteeship for Formosa would be like, I just, to make it clear, to suggest to the people in New York that they should go back to gaslighting. I see. Well, Dr. Tsiang, now that we have had this settlement at Geneva of the Indochina question, where do you think Red China will turn next? I think uh, the world communists, including the uh, communists of China, will continue to exploit opportunities in Southeast Asia. That region, that Indochina, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Burma, Malaya, that seems to me to be their a uh, primary center of concentration. Well, do you think Formosa itself is in danger from the uh, mainland forces of communist China? No, not so much. Some, not so much. The reason is because of the ocean between. Red China does not have a military power, a maneuver power to speak of. Well, Dr. Chang, is the converse also true? Is there any possibility of nationalist China invading the communist China across the, the straits from Formosa? Uh, that's our plan. We want to do it. I cannot tell you when that will take place. I can assure you it will eventually take place. But it would demand naval forces from your allies, principally the United States, I take it. My own idea is that my government should acquire the power of independent offensive. Do you think, uh, Dr. Tsiang, that Red China will ever uh, engage in open aggression the way the Koreans, the North Koreans did across the 38th parallel? Or do you think that their aggression will continue to be aggression by subversion, you might say? I think in Southeast Asia, the pattern they'll continue to use is the one they have used in Indochina. Well, in that case, what can the West do to prevent these more subtle forms of aggression where you don't have a clear open and shut case of aggression? Well, the Western world can do several things. One, you must give the threatened peoples positive assurance that you are behind them. Secondly, you and other free countries should show those people and get their own governments, their own authorities, to work a plan whereby those peoples can be convinced that human beings have better ways of achieving a better standard of living than by way of communism. And Dr. Tsiang, as an official of the Formosa Nationalist Government of China, what is your personal opinion of the agreement that has been reached in Indochina with the uh, Viet Minh communists and the Red Chinese communists? I myself think it is a great mistake. First of all, you have the material losses and gains to, to think of. 12 million people, so much territory, and coal mine, tungsten, 
Wolfram in North Vietnam. These are uh, material gains or losses. Then on the other hand, the immature, the invisible losses to the free world are immense. The free world has lost the confidence to a considerable degree of all the people of that region. And the morale of all these peoples has received a very uh, severe blow. Oh, today, when you think that Ho Chi Minh, the leader of the Viet Minh, nine years ago started with almost nothing and got to the half of Vietnam. Now with half of Vietnam, how much he can do in other nine years? Well, Dr. Chiang, the world is in a state of momentary peace right now. How long do you think that state of security can last? That's a very difficult question. The difficulty comes uh, uh, this way. Nowadays, it's difficult to tell whether we do or do not have peace. Take from this war in China, the American people have generally become aware of it in only the last two or three years. But as a matter of fact, that war has been going on for nine years, ever since Japan surrendered. That's the reason why it's very difficult to answer a question of this uh, of your kind. But if you should mean a uh, big war, uh, third world war, I must say I have no answer. I don't think anybody can answer that. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chang. It's been very interesting to hear your comments tonight. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and Richard Whitkin. Our distinguished guest was His Excellency, Dr. Ting Fu F. Chiang, permanent representative from China to the United Nations. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is world-renowned for technical excellence. In each Longines watch, the qualities of greater accuracy and long life are permanently inbuilt through scientific design and faultless workmanship. As a matter of fact, a Longines watch, when properly cared for, improves with use, is better after five or even ten years than it was when new. Now, the purchase of a Longines watch is consequently a long-term investment in satisfaction. It's because of technical excellence that Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in observatory competitions, in sports, in aviation, and in science. When you buy a Longines watch for yourself or as an important gift, you buy one of the finest watches in all the world. And yet there are many beautiful models for ladies and gentlemen priced as low as 7150. And remember that if you pay 7150 or more for a watch, you're paying the price of a Longines. So, why not insist on getting a Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. At Longines Whitnor Jewelers see Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by Lecoultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by variations in the temperature of the atmosphere. Atmos, product of Lecoultre, division of Longines Whitnor. <laughs>